well, he does collaborative filtering. Um, he does a lot of things in Horse and Farm. He does collaborative filtering. He shows how to do embeddings. He shows how to, he talks about uh, um, momentum and exponentially weighted averaging. <clears throat> and, you know, he, you know, he reviews the um, stochastic gradient descent, but then he shows, then he adds the concept of regularization, of, of L2 regularization on top of that, which uh, he, he also in the form of weight decay. And then he introduces wow. momentum. That's quite an agenda today. <laughs> no, I, th I think it's not that terrible. Um, if okay. if uh, someone doesn't come in to do it, then I can I can go over a bit of it, mainly not all of it, but a bit of it. Um, and then uh, and then so so he's still and then at the end he leaves it. He's not quite done with the uh, with the embedding uh, 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 spreadsheet or the embedding. Uh, uh, he, he he has a notebook that does embedding, and he's he's gonna he's not he didn't quite finish it this time. He's gonna finish it next time. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I've found the paper. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can see it. All right. Yes. Uh, can if someone could monitor the chat because you cannot open it while you're sharing your screen. Pardon? I'm sorry. I didn't. So, I missed what you said. If you could monitor the chat because I cannot open yeah. it while sharing my screen. Monitor the what? Oh, the, the chat. chat. The chat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, that's fine. Um, so this paper presents this idea of using easy data augmentation, and this is done on a bunch of data sets. So I, I'm not very familiar with these data sets, but uh, just to point these out. Um, one second. So there are five data sets that they've tested these techniques upon. And uh, what uh, techniques are being followed, I'll just uh, walk over them, walk through them uh, quickly. The data sets are these five. Um, you could look over the details, I'll share the link to this paper as well. Uh, so they've linked these off. What uh, they've presented is, it's called easy data augmentation and this paper is by uh, Jason V and Kaizu. So, these uh, four ideas are essentially presented in this paper, which are synonym replacement, uh, random insertion, random swapping, and random deletion. So I think that's pretty self-explanatory. And what the authors have claimed here is just using these four techniques, they, they've sort of achieved a performance bump in all of these four data sets. And apart from that, they've also claimed that when you're working with small, quote unquote, small data sets, or um, with examples lesser than 500, you generally tend to overfit. And uh, the extent to which these techniques have helped in avoiding overfitting have also been discussed or uh, discussed in this paper. So. I'll sort of quickly go over the highlights of the paper. Another thing that they've highlighted and I'm also excited about is um, some of the researchers, they propose this technique, especially, for example, this French and back into English translation, where you know you sort of have a data set in English and you translate that um, using whatever technique that you have available. I'm not sure what uh, is done in this paper particularly, but it's also been discussed in general on Kaggle forums as well. So you translate it to another language and then you translate back to English. So in general, you would expect some change in the original sentence and this change sort of in itself is good enough to give you a boost or give you a data augmentation enough to be uh, able to you know, push your general, uh, generalization a bit. So that's another technique that's sort of highlighted in this paper. So what the authors have proposed here is these four techniques. Synonym replacement, randomly choosing N words from the sentences that are not stop words. Uh, stop words are generally words that are skipped over when you're working with NLP tasks. So words, for example, articles, uh, and similar things that generally do not add a lot to the meaning of the sentence are skipped. 
and we replace these with synonyms chosen at random um the the model they've used is based on word in it and that's mentioned in the glossary section of this paper another technique they use is random insertion so find a random synonym of a word that is not a stop word insert that synonym into a random position into a sentence now based on my intuition even uh, this might add a lot of randomness to this but the authors have claimed that if under of uh, this is done under control it generally gives a performance boost another thing is randomly choosing two words in a sentence and swapping their positions again from intuition we might argue that this might completely change the meaning of the sentence so in this paper they've used this value to like for example 10% augmentation or 20% augmentation so later in the paper they propose that if you use it under limited percentages it gives a slight amount of boost especially on smaller data sets so again something counterintuitive happening here and another thing is randomly deleting so you randomly remove each word in a sentence with probability p something slightly similar to drop out now how is this executed you have this thing called alpha and l so alpha is a parameter that indicates the percentage of word in a sentence is that are changed and uh, they do have the code available so you could manually chip in the alpha values and see for yourself how well does that help you they they provided extensive values uh, late in this paper uh, documenting their experiments so i want to point your attention to this little table these are the training uh, set sizes and these are the different values when they've applied these eda techniques on top of them so as you can see in almost or i suppose in at least all of the categories you do see slight or huge amounts of improvements especially on the smaller training set size i would say it it's not very significant on the full set so what uh, they've done in the experiments is they've taken these chunks of the full data sets the ones that are mentioned the five data sets and they've applied ed on smaller percentages on it of it to see how well can you perform with smaller data so for rnn you can see about 4% boost for cnns they use cnns for text augment uh, text uh, classification again something that i am especially not familiar with but uh, they've also argued that earlier work has been done along these similar lines so that's another thing they've tried the details of the architectures are in the glossary of this paper i could highlight them as well it's a simple model nothing fancy going on in the model but the highlight of this paper is how much these techniques are helpful when you're experimenting with these sort of base architectures another thing is just taking the average so again a 3% boost and on the full data set it's not as significant it's just 1% uh, i do see some highlights in the chat so are there any questions there was just the question what the task uh, is and the question was classifying sentiments yeah you know i think it's some sort of text classification right so what 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 what, are, what do they essentially classify the or how do they classify the text what is the goal um uh, it's it's using simple rnn and cnn architectures the architectures aren't very fancy so the highlight of their paper is at least how much the eda techniques help in these tasks when uh, with and without So Sonia, the task, the task itself is <clears throat> is a sentiment classifier like plus or minus. Is that is that is that it then? Let me just quickly verify that. So yes, it is. Uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, that simple or if there are complications because I haven't gone through the data sets. I see. Uh, so you said something about language uh trans is it does it have in does it have language translation in among the it tasks? does not have language translation it just 
text classification uh, but i'm not sure if it's sentiment or uh, are there other things involved i see okay so I'll, someone I'll asks, someone asks for some examples of text classification tasks i guess the easiest one is is a movie reviews or anything reviews amazon reviews just to say thumbs up or thumbs down um that's you know just a plus minus uh, another example would be when you want to uh, classify with a numerical scale like 0 to 5 or something like that um that would be another example of of text classification um you know the sentiment can be graded from 0 to 5 in an integer um and uh i don't know are, can anyone else think of some text classification uh example um there was you know what I think about when I hear the word text classification? I actually think, okay, you have this PDF, and is this, I don't know, is this a diagnosis, or is this some sort of uh, uh, yearly report of a company? That that's, but I'm, I think I'm totally wrong here now. No, I think that you're, that, that's, I think they call that topic, uh, something about topic, that's a topic, you know, deciding okay. what the topic of the text is. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's sentiment classification someone has pointed out it's mentioned in the introduction and um, because it isn't uh, translating to french and back that's another thing that i am personally excited about another um, sort of nlp augmentation technique uh, for yeah. the paper uh, so sorry you think that would work well to tr like when you're trying to translate an english sentence into an or into another language, you think that these techniques could work well, or has anyone uh, has anyone studied that? There are a few papers around it. Uh, they have been highlighted in these uh, in this paper as well, and it's not the highlight of those paper. Those are sort of helper techniques that um, the authors had used to boost their accuracies in whatever task mm -hmm. they were uh, aiming at. But I, I do feel that that would definitely help. It's also been discussed in the Kaggle forums. Yeah, I like I like the idea of randomly dropping a word because that sounds a lot like dropout, <laughs> and uh, it, it it seems like that could help to regularize. Uh, any, so what any... the the argument in this paper as well is if you do that too much or if you uh, like tune it up 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 a notch, then you might essentially lose out the meaning of the sentence. So sure, and they yeah. don't have a uh, thumb rule of the digits that you, if it's it works enough under. 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 values or it underperforms. They have the experiments, but there's no rule of thumb when or what to do in what cases. So another thing they've highlighted is how much does EDA help when you're using percentage of the data set? So clearly it performs, if, if you look closely to this graph, it clearly performs pretty nicely when using smaller percentages of the data set. And towards the end, when using the complete data set, it almost matches the normal techniques um, accuracy, just slightly better, not so noticeable, so to speak. So I, I would say that when you're working on smaller data sets with maybe 500, 1,000 examples, to give you some context, uh, lesson four discusses IMDB uh, sentiment review, and that has 50,000 examples in total. So 500 or 1,000 examples would be pretty small. And also to mention that in the IMDB test, we're using this pre-trained ULM model or pre-trained language model that we further fine-tune. And uh, the authors haven't done that. So just training from scratch, you can expect a accuracy bump. So is this, does this <clears throat> coincide? I mean, I know you've studied um, image augmentation quite a lot. Does this coincide with what you've learned about image augmentation, that it helps more with smaller data sets than with larger data sets? I think image augmentation helps even with bigger data sets. It's not an offset. But I, yeah, I think it does coincide that when you need, uh, when you have a smaller data set, you would definitely need augmentation to help you. Right. I don't want to go through the complete paper, just sort of give you the highlights in this case. So alpha is sort of the hyperparameter that they said that this is the extent or percentage to which 
they'll augment their um, data set and these are the values that they have experimented with 0.05 5% 10% 20% up to 50% and they like i had argued that the original sentence did or might have lose their original meaning so they've done this plot of the space visualization of the augmented sentences i'm not sure how or how this might be useful or what this is exactly but based on the text it says that since these are pretty closer to the original and augmented point not much meaning is lost uh, when you using this techniques called eda so i think what th this is similar to a plot that jeremy showed in lesson 5 i think it was in lesson 5 where you're plotting uh two of the latent variables against each other La the latent variables are the ones that are are learned in the embedding in the embeddings and mm -hmm. so um you can see by comparing the open circles and the dots that that uh these uh that you know doing these augmentations isn't changing the positions in space of the of the magenta uh, of the magenta points and it's not changing too much the positions in the space of the uh, cyan points it's just perturbing them a bit that's i think that's the takeaway of that plot yeah so that's the um supporting argument that these techniques do not alter the original meaning of those sentences and finally they highlight uh, how much alpha is useful in all of these scenarios so sr is synonym replacement ri is random insertion rs is random swapping and rd is random deletion so this is the summarizing uh, graph plot of all of these things so these different lines represent the number of examples and alpha is the value to the or to the percentage to which you actually perform these techniques so the clear winner i think is obviously on the smaller data set like joseph said that on smaller data sets you definitely want to do this and on the full data set it's not as pronounced and it especially declines when you increase the amount to which you augment your original data so you can see that the line is dropping which means the performance gain is going down performance gain is there on the y axis and towards the end they've done this uh, comparison with other techniques their uh, argument is that other techniques involve um, translations which are costly experiments in the sense that you would need a deep learning architecture to maybe augment your data or if you're using a vae which is an auto encoder variational auto encoder again you would need a lot of cost computational cost so this is sort of an easy technique or light technique to do so and to answer the question that should you be do, uh, doing this they've said that in general it's pretty useful why should uh, it's answered in this section called why should i use ed instead of other techniques so they've said that uh, just give it a try and with ed we aim to provide a set of simple techniques that are general generalizable to a range of nlp tasks and they've argued that it's not highly likely that it might hurt your performance but in some cases they they said that if you tune it up like i said to a large number your original meaning of the sentence might get lost so make sure you don't do it to a large extent um, this is available as open source i am also trying to implement this to go along with the lesson for maybe maybe try to beat the original uh, accuracy but i'll i'll let you know how that goes I, i would say it's it's an easy thing to implement please give it a try if you're interested and um i'm i'm open to any questions regarding this uh, these are the points that i wanted to highlight um i guess my question is uh oh by the way that was an excellent presentation especially um uh of a nice nice short paper <laughs> um oh, so but uh, are are you aware of any uh well i i'm not aware of i haven't looked into this 
subject, but I'm wondering about other techniques for um, for doing this kind of data augmentation task for uh, for text data. Are you aware of any other uh, popular techniques that are used for this? Um, one that I had mentioned is translating to a language and back. Uh, there's another paper called back translation, if I remember ah, correctly. Ah, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. And in, in this Quora competition that happened recently, uh, Grandmaster had pointed out that you could translate to a few languages and back to English. So if even if you use Google Translate, you can always notice this slight variation in your sentences. Yeah, yeah. His argument is that that helps your model generalize better. So basically, you're just messing things up a little bit. You're just poking at it and messing things up a little bit, and that seems to help with regularization. I guess that's... that's From what idea. I know, uh, you... Like, I'm not familiar with what an uh, LSTM generally learns. It, it does know how to predict the next word, but you might be overfitting, and if you add this noise, I would say under control, it might be pretty helpful in that case. Yeah. yeah. So about okay. the architecture, the architecture highlights are here. The RNN is a simple RNN model. A input layer followed by a bidirectional hidden layer and 64 LSTM cells. A dropout layer and it's 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 a standard uh, RNN. Like there's nothing fancy here. So the paper is really a highlight of how it might be helpful to use these techniques. Any okay, other well, questions? If there's no other questions, we could ask if Dinesh is ready to um, present on lesson five. Uh, sorry, guys. Um, I didn't prepare. I I, I I thought I am on next week, ah. so I don't. <laughs> so that's the okay. confusion. Um, I, I guess I can try to do this because I just went through this lesson uh, yesterday and today. So I can try to go through it. I'm, I'm not promising a great. <laughs> but, uh, Joseph, I, this is Marcello gonna... speaking. Pardon? Yeah, this is Marcello speaking. Yes, Marcello. Just, just a reminder, if there is a little time at the end of the lesson, I'd, I'd like to share something about tabular data experiments. I did. I have some questions if, uh, on, um, on the tabular data. It is, it is on, on lesson four, but also I tried to implement sure, some. We, we, yes, uh, let's, let, let's do that. Um, I'll, I'll try to get through this in, in half an hour, and then, uh, and then the remaining time you can, uh, you can ask, you know, you can present your project, okay? Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, let's see. I want to share a screen. Uh, let me see. Um, share. Okay. Um, and I want to do this. Meanwhile, Joseph, I'll I'll monitor the chat and let you know if there are any okay. questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, that's not what I wanted to share. <laughs> Hold on. Um, Somebody's... I'll also share a Kaggle kernel where I'm trying to implement this paper and eventually try it on IMDB dataset. Uh, please check it out if you're interested. Sounds great, Sanyam. This, is, this, is this working yet? Uh, somebody's sharing, which I'm trying to do. Um, so somebody, I think it's Antonio Juan, um, you should stop sharing so that I can share. Oops, sorry about that. Somehow. We saw see, 20 of the submission answers. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to uh, resume share. Uh, okay. Something's working, not, something's not working here. But um, I think you are sharing each other. Oh, are you are you seeing? Um, well, no, no longer. Uh, yeah, I just I just. Oh, um, yes. Um, okay, hold on. Um, there is share. So it's supposed to work when I click in the screen. It's supposed to share. Uh, is it sharing what I want it to share? No. Nope. Oh, I don't now, see now. how about now? How about oh, now? Oh yes. Okay. So we're we seeing deep lesson five notes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the idea is, I, I decided to just sort of. I haven't even looked at these yet, but I decided to just work work through these. These are the notes by Punam. Um, so I tried Hiromi's notes last time. I'll try uh, Punam's this time. So, she, um, so 
he, he summarizes the notebooks that, are, that he refers to here. There's two of them, I guess. But he actually refers to some lesson two notebooks, too. Um, he doesn't talk too much about the Rothman notebook. Um, he talks a lot about the SGD MNIST notebook when he, uh, he writes his own uh, uh, SGD code in Python, uh, in, um, in uh, PyTorch, and then he shows how to do it in, uh, in FastAI and making it much faster. And then he, he, get, he has quite a lot of these Excel spreadsheets um, that are, they're sort of not too bad to look at when you, you know, to, to sort of operate them, but to, to actually try to create them from scratch, I think would be really difficult. Um, uh, there's one, uh, uh, at the end he talks about cross entropy. So that's the one entropy example. And then there's- yeah, Joseph, I have a question yeah. about, uh, about uh, the, the Excel file. Do you know, do any, anybody know if they are available online? Or some, you somewhere. Know, I, I think you can get them from the link to the class, uh, to the the original link to the class. I'll I'll put I'll make a note to put that up later. I'll find yeah, the cool. I'll I'll dig up the a lot about uh, uh, Google Sheets, but uh, uh, so I thought it was uh, the way he was willing to share it. Uh, so I, not I sure think he it. does. Uh, I think they, they are they do course repository. I'll, I'll dig up the link. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Uh, she, so they review the components of the neural network that he refers to in this uh, in this talk. He's, he talks about the activations, uh, which you know, which are the uh, column vectors that get multiplied by the weight matrices. Um, he talks about the different activation functions, which uh, which well, he doesn't talk about a lot of them, but these activation functions actually act on the activations uh, on a component by component in a, a element by element fashion. So when you talk about the ReLU you know, you're applying that function to each element of the, uh, of the activations. The activations are a column vector. Um, and he talks about uh, the fact that you need, it, that the activation function provides the nonlinearity that you need uh, to make this thing, to make this concept of a neural network able to uh, approximate any function you want, which is the universal approximation theorem he talks about. Um, he talks about the loss function. Um, and the loss function that we all, know about is, uh, you know, mean squared error. That's, that's a very uh, intuitive kind of loss function. But then he also talks about the cross entropy loss function at the end. So we'll, we'll get into that. And uh, the soft max that you have to use when you're working with the cross entropy loss function. Um, these diagrams, uh, I always find them weird because Jeremy thinks backwards in my mind. He, he, he multiplies matrices from the left and it's just really weird. So when I look at these diagrams, a diagram like this, I translate it to the, uh, you know, the, the trans, for example, he talks about this column vector multiplied by that matrix. In my mind, I translate it to the transpose of this matrix multiplied by that column vector. Um, um, and, and then it works for me, but I just can't think the way he does in multiplying matrices backwards. <laughs> Does anybody else have that problem? Um, do you know what I'm talking about? Like normally, when you talk about matrix multiplication, you're multiplying uh, from you're multiplying a matrix on the left times a column vector on the right, and then you're getting uh, a column vector, right? But that, that, that's correct. I I, I found it um, a bit strange as well. Like when yeah. he talks about the multiply the matrix, and then I I always look like I think number of columns need to be yeah. equal to rows, but, and they are. Yeah. Yeah, if you take this, that's, that's actually one. very fundamental, Dinesh, what you just yeah. said. That's only how um, matrix multiplication essentially works. Yeah, yeah and, and you, yeah, take, but you then, take this thing and you, you take the transpose of the whole thing, and then it becomes a, a, an 8 by 5 matrix multiplied by a, five, a column vector of 5, and then it works. Uh, it gives you this 8, 8. So it's just a different way of thinking about matrix multiplication. It's perfectly, I'm sure it's perfectly valid, but in my mind, my brain is trained on the other way. So I... I always translate it for myself when I see it. Um, I don't know how, how many other people think and easily think about this kind of, you know, multiplying this this column vector by this matrix and written down this way and getting this column vector. Does anybody think of that as the natural way to multiply the matrices? No, uh, I agree with you, Joseph. <laughs> yeah. uh, Joseph okay. Are you sharing anything else than uh, the page with the notes? Because you're referring to some pictures. Oh, I'm, I, isn't it working when I'm scrolling? No. no. Um, oh, that's. Oh, it says your screen. I'm sorry. Your screen sharing is paused. Uh, I don't understand why this is happening. Uh, I have this orange uh, 
warning, I can stop the share and try again. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me try that again. Uh, now my share is this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, share. Okay. Are you seeing this thing now? This yes. Okay. Yes, we see I, it now. I'm yeah. very sorry. I thought you all were seeing this. So I'm looking at this purple. This example, this central um, here, this uh, purple column vector multiplied by this uh, uh, five by eight uh, yellow uh, weight matrix, right? And the way Jeremy thinks about it is the purple column vector comes first, and then this uh, five uh, five by eight weight vector comes. The weight matrix comes. But when I see this, what I'm saying is that I take the transpose of the whole thing because it's the same thing. Uh, and I take the, I see a uh, five by, uh, an eight by five matrix multiplied by a column vector of five. And then I get the same result of the eight, of a column vector of eight. In, in other words, that's, I'm back, that's, sorry. That's, that's, that's quite right. Because if you look at, uh, I, I think number of rows uh, w what I learned in school is like a number of rows need to be equal to number of columns. Yeah. So it yeah. has to be yes. like if you're multiplying, yeah. it has to be transposed beforehand. Yeah. Um, I think um, for this to work, maybe you'd have to make this five, uh, this five, uh, not a column vector, but a row vector. And then it would work, uh, but you'd end up getting a row vector. So, you know, you'd end up getting the same, the same eight, the same vector of length eight, but it would be a row vector. So anyway, that's just an aside. That's not really important, but I'm just, think, I'm just thinking that's just kind of a strange way of thinking about things. Now I'm going to try scrolling and see if you guys can follow it. Is, is it scrolling? Yes, we if can follow it. Great. Okay, great. Let me know if it doesn't, right? Um, okay, then he talks about how the weights are adjusted by uh, multiplying, by subtracting the learning rate times the, um, times the gradient of the parameter, which, you know, which is from stochastic gradient descent. Um, he talks about an ele element-wise function, that an activation function is to be applied element-wise. So if you apply an activation function to a column vector like this, you're um, multiplying each, you're applying the function in turn to each element of the, of the column vector. So that's how to do it. Um, let's see, here we go. Back propagation, we said that. Um, all right. Uh, okay, then he talks about when you, when you take a pre-trained network, of, uh, and you uh, apply it to a new problem, what you, the first thing you do, and, and FastAI does this automatically, is it takes out the, this is the image net, for example, which has a thousand outputs. Um, um, you, you take the last layer, and, and the reason is a thousand, is because it's classifying the images into a thousand different classes. So you take the last layer and you uh, just exit out, erase it, uh, and put in your own, because suppose you're just making a, suppose you just have a five-way classification problem. Then you need to replace this uh, this matrix by another one that will give you a, a column vector of five outputs, right? So that's what he's saying. But and and this is what he uh, I think what, when he uh, says unfreeze, uh, it's it's unfreezing just the last layer and letting you train that layer. And then the next step is to gradually unfreeze the uh, the, the the subsequent layers that are a, a little deeper. But um, he says that since those what he talks about uh, this paper by Fergus and Zeiler, which I think we've all seen reference to, where he's showing what the what a convolutional network is learning in its in its layers, um, and he shows that the early layers are the early layers at the very front, right after the input. There are things like edges and shadows and darkness and so on, and then uh, the deeper layers are learning more sophisticated features like uh, like curved things, circles, eyes, fur, that sort of thing. Um, and, and so this is a really exciting way to understand what these neural networks are doing um, in ImageNet. They're, they're, they're actually training uh, layers that are recognizing, you know, flowers and wheels and different geometric patterns and so on. Um, and some of these, and, and then the later levels, they're recognizing the faces, you know, the human faces, the dog faces, and the eyes and so on. So what he says is that the way to optimally do this is to gradually unfreeze the, the later layers and, and learn them. Maybe you get better uh, parameters for your particular application and then, and then go a little farther deeper into the network and unfreeze. Um, and, and, but don't unfreeze everything at once. Just un, unfreeze uh, uh, 
partially um, the, the, the layers. And when I say partially, I mean the learning rate makes the learning rate uh, small. So he talks about these, this feature in, uh, in uh, fast AI where you can specify a cha uh, changing, you know, a set of learning rates. So if you say 1e minus 3, you can either enter a learning rate as just a number, and then it will apply that learning rate to all, all the layers. Uh, but if you apply a slice, then it will, uh, it will intrinsically apply 1e minus 3 to the last layer, and then it will apply a smaller learning rate, that is that divided by 3, to the, uh, to the other layers. And I think what I mean by other layers, I think he says he divides the layers into groups, uh, the last group of layers and the first group of layers. And I'm not sure how he does that intrinsically, but he does divide them into two groups. And then finally, um, so if you just say a slice and then give it one number, then it, it, it implicitly uh, says that, okay, I'm going to use the last layer, 1e minus 3, and this, the last group of layers, 1e minus 3, and the second of the last group of layers is going to be 1e minus 3 divided by 3. So that's an implicit way. But another way you can specify the command is, is actually explicitly say what you want as far as the learning rate. So w this would say what, 1e minus 3 for the last layer, and then for the deeper layer, 1e minus 5. Don't, train, uh, don't let it, you know, don't let it move the weights so much. The smaller learning rate does that. So, uh, okay, so that's uh, that. Then he starts, to, to talks about the collaborative filtering problem. And uh, here there's this, this general idea that you want to, uh, you have a, a matrix of users and, uh, and, and items. And the, the users could be moviegoers and the items could be movies. Uh, but this is the matrix of, of users and movies. And I think the, uh, okay, so the movies are the items, the column vector, and the users are the, sorry, the movies are the, uh, are the rows. Uh, the movie IDs are the rows and the user IDs are the columns. So this matrix t tells you, the way you read it is say, okay, user number uh, 79 gives a 4.05 rating to movie number uh, 293. And so in a problem like this, you always have, uh, you're going to always have uh, empty, you know, missing data because not every user is going to rate every movie. But the magic uh, thing he does is he shows how to, uh, how to uh, fill in those things, how to fill in those missing values by factoring the matrix into two factors. Uh, this factor on the left, uh, and this factor on the right. And you, so these are two matrices which us, which you, by design, want, you want to multiply them together to get the matrix that you have in the middle. And, and the idea is you need to, you solve iteratively for the weights in these, in these matrices. And the, he just adopts the idea that I'm going to have a five by number, I'm going to have five um, vectors uh, in, for the users and five vectors for the movies. But you could have any number of vectors uh, any number of vectors here, in other words, any number of columns here and the same number of rows here. And the product of those two matrices would then, uh, by design, yield this matrix. Yeah, so, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah, you said that the, the number of uh, columns uh, and rows, which determines, uh, um, the, 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 I would say, which are outside the matrix, so the ones, the, 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 the ones uh, with the red square and the purple square. They can be yes. any number, but they have to be the same. That's right. That's right. Because those are the inner, that's the inner dimension in the matrix multiply. <clears throat> that's going to be the inner dimension, and they have to be the same. Does yeah. That but then uh, that confuses me a little bit about the interpretation he gave a little ahead in the lesson when he says that uh, the numbers there can be intended as uh, embeddings. That means, uh, if I understand correctly, um, for example, germs. Of, of, of movies or um, intention yeah, features, of, of a user. So, yeah, yeah, features. But if they are features, then it's a little weird that you, have to, you need to have the same number of features for movies as the same number of features for users because they're two different domains. That's true. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, why can't you have, well, it's just that it, it needs to be the same in order for the matrix product to work out. Um, so I, yeah, I, I agree with you that it's strange that you 
But uh, on the other hand, it doesn't really matter. I mean, this number can be smaller, it can be large, uh, and you can make it as big or as small as you want. And I think Jeremy just experimented with it to find, I think he found that uh, 20 or 40 was optimal, something like that. But if you make it five, then it's easy to explain. You know, you can maybe try to identify something explainable. Um, okay, I'm gonna just try to move on here. Um, then he talks about uh, 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 making the model a little more sophisticated by adding biases, which is basically just a column vector that you add to the matrix product. Um, a column vector for, for the users and a column vector for the, uh, for the movies. That helps to offset the bias that a given user might have towards uh, all movies or that a given movie might receive a bias from all the users. Uh, so it's, these are just extra fact, additive factors. Um, okay, I'm just gonna keep moving. Um, so I guess the way this works is you initialize these matrices, uh, these matrices randomly, and then you just keep iterating. You, you, uh, you, you, you then multiply together and then look at the differences and, uh, and uh, correct correct towards the uh, uh, what you want and then you keep doing it iteratively until you get until you get close so but and you use the um, mean squared error as your uh, as your uh, metro as your loss function so um, okay here keep going oh did we get to the end of her notes this is not good that's all she did um, is that uh, is that the actually the end of, of her notes on this? I think it is. I'm going to go back to uh, Hiromi's notes then because I think she did the whole thing. So I'm going to stop, uh, get Hiromi's notes. Did anyone else try to uh, play around with that book? When I trained, uh, trained for longer, it started to overfit right after the second epoch for me. What, were you training with uh, with just SGD, or were you training with uh, with momentum? Or actually, I'm talking about the uh, this, uh, collaborative filtering notebook. So just with uh, the defaults in the notebook. Uh, I haven't tried to train with that yet. Oh, here they are. Okay, um, I'm going to share this. Sorry, I'm finding Romy's notes and then sharing them. Share. Share. No, that's not what I want. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble identifying what I want to share. Um, Notes from my This should be it. And then, what are, what are you seeing when I'm sharing now? Join via computer. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to get rid of that because it, that's not the that's not where my mouse was when I started sharing. All right, uh, one more time. Share and. It's not sharing what I tell it to share. I don't understand this. Sorry about this. Um, all right. Um, so I tell, uh, it's green highlighted on Hiromi's notes, and I say share, and then it goes to this thing. So don't get that. Get that up there. Uh, stop share. Uh, are you seeing Romy's notes now? No, Hello? I think I think they're zoomed in. Yeah, let me uh, zoom out. Okay, yeah. Okay, so this is, this no, is I can see. 
Okay, so going past where we were, I, I know I have to I have to wrap it up in five minutes, and I'm sorry I, I'm not going to be able to get to the end because I promised uh, Marcello that he can uh, that he can talk. But uh, I just Joseph, wanna... no problem. If you're going to go a little ahead, no problem. I, okay, well, let me. Um... Fifteen minutes, it's okay for me. No problem. Okay, now I'll just see if there's a good stopping point. Um, he he goes through this notebook that the eminence notebooks and how some of these uh, how some of these functions that he uses the for the uh, collab learner are are, uh, are defined but I want to go back uh, oh, okay he actually runs his notebook he finds uh, oh and then he mentions this uh, this little trick about uh, Latin one encoding like when you open up this old old text file um, he has to use this encoding equals Latin one in order to get it to in order to get it to parse. Otherwise, if he doesn't use Latin one, then he gets this error, codex, uh, Unicode error, codex can't decode, blah blah blah. So he says that uh, if if the data is in, is in Unicode, then you don't have that problem. But for older data sets, which this uh, Internet Movie deba Database is, uh, the trick is how he got around that error is he just used this encoding. In the in the PD reads the in the pandas read CSV command. All right, um, keep him going. Um, he ran. Uh, he okay. He looked at some of the movies. Uh, just look at them. Um, then he ran the notebook. And let's see. Uh, but then he runs to this to this uh, Excel spreadsheet. And talks about it a little bit. He set up a spreadsheet to do this uh, matrix multiplication that we were talking about, um, and then he gets the movies, the user embeddings. This, remember these five by n matrices that we were talking about for the user embeddings and for the movie embeddings. And yes, again, they have the same dimension. So it's basically embedding uh, the, the the movies in a five dimensional in a, in five uh, five large. Uh, in a five-dimensional vector space. Each movie has a five-dimensional vector to represent it, and each user has a five-dimensional vector to represent it in this latent, what he calls a latent space. Um, th okay, then I mentioned he talks about adding bias and so on. And he talks about the internals of the, um, of this, uh, what does he call it? Um, Oh well, well, this is just the format that it stores the uh, the movies in, and, and he stores them in tensors. Um, interpreting weights. Uh, sorry, I'm just running through here. Okay, then he uh, plots. He just gets a feeling for for two of these dimensions, and this is like plotting two of these, uh, you know, these five dimensional vectors. He plots two of them versus each other um, for uh, a bunch of different movies. And just shows how they land on different areas of this space. He, he tries to he tries to see some interpretation about what these vectors are, but I'm not convinced <laughs> that there's anything that you can make sense out of. Um, okay. Then he goes into the guts of this collab learner function um, and this embedding dot bias class, um, and so that. There's vectors for movies and, and for users. Um, and then this collab learner object that it returns has the data set in it. And OK, and then this embedding dot bias is the most basic thing. It has the whole um, uh, forward and uh, the forward propagation in it, where you're multiplying matrices together to get the, uh, uh, to get the, uh, the answers, the, uh, rating, the movie ratings. Um, sorry, I'm running through this fast. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, okay. And he talks about this paper that where they did this, uh, wh where they uh, first introduced, or one of the papers where they introduced this um, uh, embedding idea for, uh, for categorical data. And apparently, I, I don't see the paper. Oh, here it is. Let me just run to it for a sec. Um, yeah, these guys apparently the the Kaggle Rossman competition. They wrote this paper, entity embeddings of categorical variables. Uh, I haven't read the paper, but I want to uh, want to look at. It. But uh, they did stuff like uh, uh, 
showed how, in their case, they could get some of these uh, embedding vectors to make sense. Here is, again, two of their embedding vectors plotted against each other um, and looking at some of the features of the, uh, of the, of the Rossman data. And there's a mapping. It looks like there's a one-to-one -one mapping between ge the actual geometry of the locations of the, of the shops and uh, these two uh, particular embedding vectors. So that's, that's really interesting that sometimes the, 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 uh, the concept that the network can actually learn these hidden weights all by itself without you telling it anything. Uh, and then of course what Ger got Jeremy really excited is that these guys took second place in the Kaggle competition without having any domain knowledge and that they, their embedding model allowed them to do this without knowing anything about the, the stores and, and the, the domain knowledge. Right. Um, this again, it's two features plotted against each other. I'm not sure what, oh, uh, I'm not sure what sense you can make out of it. You just connect the dots and there's a linear, I mean, it's continuous, right? Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, and then the month, January, February, March, April. Uh, it does look like it's some, there's some kind of, there's some sense of ordering the, the data in time. So again, the um, network is learning that. Um, then he talks a bit about bias and variance and how if your model is too, has too many parameters in it, you'll get overfitting. Um, but then he sort of throws, throws water on this and says that um, don't worry about overfitting if you, you can have as complicated a model as you want with neural networks, as long as you throw in a whole bunch of regularization. And he talks about uh, different kinds of regularization. We, we, we talk, in this lesson, he talks about uh, uh, the uh, L2 regularization, or call it, he, he also calls it uh, weight decay. They're not exactly the same. That's one form of, of regularization. And what yes, that is, wait, is Joseph, yeah. just, just to uh, make a little comment here, weight decay is something else than regularization, I think. It's very close, though. It's L2 regularization and weight decay are very close. They're almost the same. Um, L2 regularization is when you add the extra term to the loss function, um, and weight decay is when you add the extra term to the derivative. So it's, they're almost the same. Um, and for, for practical purposes, sometimes can be the same. Yeah, but um, he, there's two other forms of regularization that he starts talking about, and think, I think that'll be in the next lesson. Dropouts and batch normalization are also ways to, uh, to regularize your data. Dropout is where you actually uh, just randomly uh, X out some of the, uh, some of the activations in each, in each layer just at random. And that somehow, again, it's the idea of adding noise that uh, gives you a benefit of, uh, of preventing you from overfitting. So Jeremy makes a very strong statement that, don't, that, that the, old, the old wisdom about w watching out about having too many variables is false. Don't worry about the number of, don't worry about the complexity of your model as long as you throw in enough regularization. That's his, that's his mantra that I got out of this. Um, Let's see. He, he then goes through the, the notebook uh, bit by bit. Um, he uses the MNIST database again, uh, but not using it as images, just using it as flattened images of length, uh, I think it's 784, yeah, 50,000 rows by 784 columns. That's, that's a 28 by 28 image. So in this spreadsheet, you're not making use of any of the spatial connectedness of these things. It's all you know, you're, you're just uh, taking this uh, and reading it out column by column and then, and then just connecting them all together into a long vector of 784. Uh, okay, uh, what, what else can we get out of here? Um, I think we should get to the, he talks about um, using first S, plain old SGD, then he talks about uh, using regularization with SGD, and then he talks about, okay, and here's, uh, okay, so this is uh, just plain old SGD, and then the uh, L2 regularization comes when you take the loss function, which is the mean squared error here, and you add uh, the sum of the squares of the weights, uh, some constant, which he calls WD, that means weight decay, times the, square, the sum of the squares of the weights, and what that does is it uh, since you're trying to minimize this whole thing, you're driving, the, it, it sort of squishes the weights. It makes, it makes sure that you don't get any very large weights. It makes the weights uh, tend to be much smaller. And that's the, regular, that's the regularizing effect. 
Um, so, um, I mean, I don't know if you've, if you've ever had any experience trying to fit to, uh, I'm going back to this cubic curve. Uh, cubic curves can just go wild uh, out, uh, out the edges, right? If you, and and uh, you can fit lots of cubics to this, to this set of data. And the ones that go the wildest are the ones with the largest parameters, you know, the thetas. Uh, the, if you get really huge thetas, you can just get really wild results over here. But regularization is mitigating against that. It's forcing the um, cubic model to stay with small weights. So, uh, Joseph, I think you're having connection problems telling me that my internet connection is unstable am i dropping out hello now it's now it's better now it's better okay thank you um he has these uh excel spreadsheets which again are really nice to look at uh, i would hate to i would hate to create one of these it must be a hell of a lot of work um but it's really nice to look at what he's doing he's um he's calculating the um these derivatives both directly and with uh and with finite differences, because these this function here, you can differentiate that um, directly if you know how to do derivatives, and that's here and here. Um, but he also does it by finite differences, uh, where you sort of make an estimate of the derivative by subtracting the the value of the function at you know the you know how it is dy df dx you know delta delta f over delta x. So you choose a finite delta x, and then you evaluate the delta function. Uh, and, and, and you calculate that, that's the finite differencing method. And he shows uh, in one of his spreadsheets how they approach each other very closely. Um, so I won't go into that. Um, then, and then he, this is the guts of his, uh, he has to make some macros to, to run this. This is a very sophisticated Excel spreadsheet and you have to use Visual Basic and, uh, and uh, macros and so on. And to me, it's just, I don't know why, you know, I, why would you do this when you have, uh, you know, when you have Python? But uh, but it is very nice. That's that's, that's also a question I asked myself. Yeah. Why would it's, why it's in, nice, on the world would you use Excel? <laughs> yeah, it's a nice pedagogical tool though because it's really nice to look at these spreadsheets and you can actually look at the numbers and see how they're coming out so nicely. So I think that's worthwhile. Um, then he talks about this exponentially weighted moving average where you uh, instead of updating with uh, alpha times the derivative. You update with alpha times the gradient, alpha times the derivative plus one minus alpha times the previous weight. So you have this parameter you're trying to update, right? And the uh, the uh, the normal way to update it is to is to uh, just subtract the derivative from the uh, from the previous one. But it, but he says instead you you take one minus one minus alpha times the previous one. So it's a slight variation of the uh, L2, uh, uh, of the, sorry, of the SGD. And, and this is exponentially weighted moving averages. And if you, I, I haven't done this, but I want to do it. Um, if you actually calculate this, you, you'll find that it is related to an exponential. And, and it, it sort of gives a, a high weight to the more recent values and a lower weight to the values in the past. And, and it, it's a way of actually uh, putting memory into it. You know, you can you can retain something of what happened before into your next wait, into your next update. Uh, was there a question? I thought I heard someone ask a question. Oh, okay. Um, then he talks about another, again, another variation on this. Um, let's see. Um, RMS prop. I think that's the. Um, I think that's this exponentially weighted moving average uh, method of updating. He says that Jeffrey Hinton invented this in a Coursera course that he, that he, that's still on the, it's free right now, it's online. Um, and then, uh, okay, so, oh, wait, wait, momentum is the exponent. When we say momentum, we're talking about this uh, exponentially weighted moving average, that this method here. But then RMS prop is something more sophisticated where you divide this by the, I think, uh, X is the gradient, it's, it's the average of the gradient. I'm not sure what X is here. Exponential of 
S8 squared, the gradient squared. Okay. So it involves calculating the exponentially weighted moving average of the of the gradient squared. Um, that's what he says here. Okay. Um, so there. Um, I, I think to give. I think I'm going to stop here. Adam is another flavor of this. Uh, he just these are more sophisticated ways to do um, a stochastic gradient descent, but you're doing the same thing. It's a way of updating the weights, uh, to, and, he, and he shows how things converge faster and faster and faster when you use these methods. Uh, Adam being the best one that he found, and then he talks about the way of uh, the uh, uh, way that uh, Leslie Smith found to. Uh, I forget what he calls it, adaptive weights or something like that, where you ramp up the weights really fast and then you ramp them down. Uh, uh, you ramp up the weights until the loss function blows up and then you and then you start to uh, start to zero in on the weights that you want. And uh, let's see, I think one of these plots is for the weight itself and the other is for the momentum. I'm not sure which is which. Um, let's see. But he does show that these methods get better and better, um, and, and, and when implemented in uh, fast AI, they're even, they're even better, because fast AI has all these little tricks in it. Um, all right, then he goes back and he talks about uh, cross-entropy law. I, you know, I think um, next week I'm going to do lesson six, and I'll talk in detail about the cross-entropy loss. Uh, right now, I think, and that's basically where he ends, the, the, uh, the cross-entropy loss. And then, so we'll take this up again next week. And right now I'm going to turn things over to uh, Mar Marcello because he had something he wanted to present. So I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, so Marcello, you can. Okay. Thank you very much. So yeah. let me now try to share. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So to give, give you a little bit of context, uh, the data set I'm playing with is a data set coming from a company who's performing some analysis about uh, coffee machines, uh, uh, predictive maintenance. So, oh. so basically, um, the data set is an historical uh, list of events on, uh, on certain coffee machines. Uh, every coffee machine has its serial number, a model, a timestamp, of the target when we want to predict uh, the failure. And then there is, there are 20, 20 days, in this case it is weeks actually, but uh, it can be weeks or days of history. So that means that uh, 20 weeks ahead of the target, there were zero cleaning issues. Uh, if I go ahead, uh, where is failures? So these are those high-end uh, Italian uh, espresso machines you're talking about? Yeah, totally, totally. I, this is why I'm telling it's a, this is mission critical for Italy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is espresso machines, you're right. Cappuccino and so on. So They can cost like $20,000. Um, yeah, totally, totally. That's why if, I have a, if you have a couple of hours of a machine not working in a rush hour, you're, you go bust in a, if, if you are a bartender. So... It's, a, it's an important thing. So, um, so that's a data sheet, that, that's, the, that's, a, that's a data set. When, when we have a, just one categorical, um, categorical uh, feature, which is the model, then the timestamp, I will convert it uh, into a cardinal num numbers, for, starting from the beginning of the history until the, the, the target date. And then we have a lot of columns, uh, which includes counters, like, uh, this is, for example, how many co co coffees have been done from the, the previous, in this day. So you can see 15, uh, um, so, sorry, 1,500 1, coffees in one day, uh, sorry, in, in one week in this case, and so on and so forth. And the target of the prediction is what is the number of failure in the next period? In this case, it's weeks. Uh, so the week after, uh, if I'm taking this data this week, next week this machine will be will will have a failure. Of course, this is built over historical data. Okay, so it's a, a lot of columns. All of them are numerical. So my my so I try to apply to this the the technique we have seen in lesson four. Um, so 
okay, there is a little bit more of uh, data operations, but the, the, the data set we are going to use is, uh, is this one. After, after this uh, conversion and uh, in a, a normalization, which have been done, if I get it correctly, somewhere here. So when we apply all the processes, all the processes which are listed, where are listed there? Yeah, here. So, so in this case, we have this uh, categorical, uh, categorical uh, variable. All of others are um, numbers. And what if I understand correctly, we are filling the missing, which should not, should not be not there. Categorify the single category what we have here and normalization. So this is the data set which comes out. And we are taking, we have a data set of uh, 62,000 of, of, of lines. And I'm taking the last, uh, let's say 10,000 as a, as a test set. Uh, just to give you another information, the class, the classes are slightly unbalanced, not that much. I mean, there are five times more um, rows with uh, a target of error and uh, 11,000 of rows with, uh, sorry, the opposite, 11 targets, uh, 11,000 rows with errors and 50,000 of rows without errors. So they are unbalanced, but not, not terribly unbalanced. Okay, so it should be something, uh, it should be a walk in the park for, for, the, for our wonderful learners, but what happens is that okay, at the beginning I just, I'm just doing exactly as in the lesson four and I get 54 of accuracy. Okay, let's try some uh, tuning. So get the, getting the um, learning rate uh, recording. And then this is where it becomes a little weird because uh, I start fitting uh, at uh, with one in egg four, which uh, I don't know if it's, it's the right choice, but I think it's a, it's an area of the learning rate where I see the learning rate uh, decreasing uh, pretty well. It's not the minimum, maybe the minimum is somewhere else. But still, even if it's a, is possibly a little smaller than, than should be, there is a lot of up and down in the, in the accuracy. And yes, at the end, the, 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 the last line after 10 epochs is uh, the, the, the best accuracy in this example. But if you run it uh, uh, um, more and more, it, it goes, it continues goes up and go, going up and down. So my, my point is, how can I know what is the expected performance of, of the model? Because uh, I don't see it stable in any way. If I run it again, I have totally different numbers. So just to give you another example, uh, I try to make uh, a little more, uh, um, a little more, more um, a, bit, a bigger <coughs> a bigger network <coughs> so in this case uh, this is the same data set as before i've done a bigger network so more layers more more um, more uh, more parameters <coughs> so more weights let's see maybe it's a it's a it's a too many columns or too complex to learn i also try to introduce a little bit of weight more of weight decay as it is a, by default <clears throat> and I get a nice uh, 70% at the first run. Okay, I said it, I'm done. But again, when you try to fine tune it, okay, again a mess. 62, 63, 54, and that up, goes up and down. And I have no idea when I should stop or how to try to get this to a little bit of more stability. You see, also. Marco, did, you, did you try um, mar larger values of weight decay of, of WD? Yeah, I did. He talks about WD, the default is 0.01. In, in fast AI, the default is 0 0.01. But then he says that in practice, they find that 0.1 is actually usually better. So you have yeah, 0 0.05. So did yeah. you try 0 0.1? Yeah, I tried 0.1. Actually, I, 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 ended, I ended up in 0 0.05 because uh, 0 0.1 was, uh, was not working. Oh, OK. It was, it's, it's very, it was very similar as, as this one. I haven't seen very much difference. Maybe so this is good. better. This is better than before, and and a less noisy, but still, 
but still, it's not very good, right? So yeah, but the point is that I, I my question was, how can I know what is the, because one could say, okay, there is no, maybe the data set is, uh, is, is, is flowed, there is no way of, pre of predicting the failure, but uh, uh, then I saw it try to, to move in a different, uh, a different kind of model, and I, and, and I tried, uh, where is it? Sorry. So I tried some classical models. So let's forget for a moment about, uh, about deep learning. Where is it? I lost it. Okay. And I said, okay, let's try um, light gradient boost method, which uh, Jeremy said, okay, in 10, 10, 10 out of 100 of his try of his test has done with this uh, um, boost or gradient boost or whatever. And with that one, that's the result. So, and I, and I, and I went there in, in, in 11 seconds of operation. Wow. Uh -huh. The CPU, so no GPU at all. So I did this on my laptop. And the precision is 90% uh, on uh, no error and 82% or on the error. So the information is there in the, in the data set. There is enough information to get yeah. Yeah. A, good, a, good, a good estimation, but I had no way, at least with my little knowledge, of, uh, of going there with deep learning. So, so that's the question. I'm open to suggestions. Um, based, based on the first or second lesson, I think uh, you're overfitting since the accuracy improves and then goes down. And if you're just comparing it to the previous loop, so even with image tasks, I've done this thing. And every time you call the learned outfit after running it for a while and then calling it again, there's a different accuracy value. Like there's a slight amount of difference. I'm not sure how, how much it is. Uh, you do get that. But um, the other comment by Jeremy is that if your validation loss is of a large number, like in this loop, yep. uh, you, you might be doing something wrong. You mean this validation losses is so high? Yeah, that, so they, there's something uh, critically wrong somewhere. Yeah, but uh, I mean, they, I'm, I'm just using a very few lines of code, so I have no idea what can be wrong. Because, uh, yeah, there, there is, it's different uh, uh, architecture than, uh, than in the lessons, but I think it's not uh, really, it should not matter very much. So I tried uh, mm -hmm. also in, in, other, in the other, in the other Maybe example. Maybe how you prepare to um, data set, so that's also, that also weighs in here, I think. Sorry, say it again? How you prepare your data set, I think that also weighs in, in here. So that might also have a factor to it. But you yeah, prepare but, the data set the same way, right? In the other, yeah, in the totally, radius. exactly. So this, the data set here, the only thing which is different in the data set here is that, uh, of course, uh, with, uh, with the, the, the like GBM, I'm not, uh, I'm, I have, I'm not doing normalization myself. I, I think it is not done at all because it is a tree algorithm. It doesn't need normalization. Yeah. So, and of course, the data set which I give to the algorithm is not, is not like this. There is no normalization. But uh, uh, until here, everything is the same. So it's exactly the same notebook here as, uh, uh, as the one here. Uh, exactly. Gautam has asked in the chat if it's a continuous target variable that we're trying to predict here. Okay, so, uh, so, so yeah, uh, can, you, can you repeat please? The question is, is the target variable a continuous um, variable? Uh, no, it's Boolean. It's just a one or zero. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, is, there will be at least one error in the next, in the next uh, time period or okay. not. So, so it's a classification problem, right? When you yeah, say basically it's a classif is a is a Boolean classification problem. So I try to make it as simple as possible because yeah, uh, the next step will be let's predict how many errors there will be or possibly which kind of error. But at this stage, I, I will I, I'm doing it very very simple. So, so Marcello, are you using cross entropy loss? Because okay, that's critical. If you're doing a, a classification problem, your loss function should be cross entropy loss. Okay, good point. And so where should I put this? I, I I can't remember. He showed in. I know that in the lesson five notebooks, he shows where to where to do it. Um, uh, 
Also, okay. Marcelo, I have a question. You mentioned that you don't think that the architecture should have um, should play into this, uh, but why do you think that, or could you justify that? You mentioned that the the um, parameters of the architecture of the layers shouldn't uh, have any bearing on this. No, probably they have, but I don't know what. I don't know. I don't know how. I mean, because uh, because from what I've gathered, you haven't used the default, right? I've used the default in the first in the, in the first test, like okay. here. I've used the uh, what is it? The default. Uh, uh, where is it? Okay, where is the number of layers? Uh, uh, test. Okay. okay, here. So initially I used this, which is the default, exactly as the in the lesson. Okay. And uh, and so then in the in the other example, uh, I tried to make the, the network bigger and bigger because I said uh, my idea was maybe the 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 problem in the in the lesson was uh, a smaller data set with less features, so there was no need of uh, more neurons. So I said let's try a bigger one. But my problem was already there in this in, in, in the first attempt when everything was default. Okay. But I think uh, the point about uh, cross entropy could be a good point uh, if I find where to write, where to set this because, uh, because maybe that's one, uh, that's one possibility. Can you share the notebook? I'll give it a look as well. Absolutely. Uh, is everything I can share you? I can share the the link to the repository, which is here. So sounds good. I'll, I'll also give it a try. Yeah, that's, uh, if you put that in the chat, that would be great. Absolutely. Let me find where the chat is now. So uh, since we are um, not using cross entropy, so um, it's like trying to predict a value between zero and one. Is it something like that? Yes, it's trying to predict the value. Yeah, that's possible. That's possible. Yeah, but I have to discover where to put cross entropy. Mm. Good. Okay. So I think I, anyway, I, I, I will read something. There were some comments in the chat, but I was not able to to follow them where, while I was speaking. So I will. I, I've been on top of it. Uh, there are no questions for the moment. Okay. Okay, yeah, this, so that this was... is a really interesting problem because one of the, uh, you know, one of the classic forms of problems that industries uh, have to tackle is this idea of uh, of anomaly detection and, and uh, I mean anomaly prediction. It's the same thing with earthquake prediction, right? You have a uh, very you have a, a, a failure and you're trying to predict either the time to failure or whether the thing will fail or not. In your case, I'm surprised that you had. Uh, such a uh, closely balanced data set. I mean, it was only, you know, 20% of these things failed and the other uh, ones didn't. I would think that if you're making espresso machines, you should have a much lower failure rate. <laughs> yeah, I consider that uh, I had to do a lot of uh, feature engineering there because uh, there are actually a number of different failures. There are some sort of 20 different uh, failures code. I but I had no information about what is critical, what is a warning, what is just information. Yeah. yeah. Actually, there was, a, there was some indication, some labeling about critical, about the error being critical or not, or, or, but there was no, there were too messy. So some machine has the same number and different, la different critical level. So it is possible that uh, majority of the errors there are just warnings. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I don't know, water is low, please add some water, fill some water, or uh, whatever. So, so they I don't may not be serious, they may not be serious faults, but they're still faults. Yes, exactly. So the next step for me, as soon as I have uh, some meaningful model, then I will go back to the, 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 the guys who gave me the, the data, say, okay, what is really critical and what is not? But at that time, the classes will be more unbalanced again, so yeah. probably... But um, I, I, I think that uh, Jeremy said that it doesn't matter so much, for some reason, it doesn't matter so much whether the classes are imbalanced. I don't know why, but with uh, the, the neural networks, it doesn't seem to matter as much as with classes. Yeah, in my experience with classical method like Random Forest and uh, or others, uh, it, it does matter a lot. 
mm-hmm. if, uh, if they are, there is unbalancing. So it, actually in the, in the live GBM, there are some uh, um, knobs to tune if, if, it is a, if there is unbalancing. Uh, neural networks, no. But uh, in this case, it's not much unbalanced. I mean, it's uh, just one, five times more. Um, so the more meaning, the more represented class is just five times bigger than the other. So not big. Yeah, so it's not terribly balanced. Yeah. Michael has mentioned in the chat that higher momentum might help in this case. And also Naveen has asked, uh, how do we find similar users using user embedding? So he has asked if you're using cosine similarity or by nearest neighbor. Um, I, I would think cosine similarity. Um, be, um, well, let's see, but, but are these vectors, I, I don't remember whether he normalized these vectors or not. Um, if the vectors are normalized, then, um, then cosine similarity and uh, what, what should work. Um, well, no, if they're unnormalized. It, I mean, the, the question boils down to, do we want to find the distance between the endpoints of the vectors or do we want to find the angle between the vectors? Um, if, they're, if they're normalized, then the angle distance is, is all you need. Um, but that's a good question. That's a good question to think about. Does anyone have a good feeling for the answer to that one? But if, if the data is not normalized, I think nearest neighbor would be better in this case. Um, yeah, the utility and distance between the endpoints, but um, I'm still not sure whether you need to do that or whether cosine similarity could still be the right way. I don't know. Also, quick question to everyone. How are you guys preparing for part two? If uh, you will be taking it up or if you're a member of the live part two? Well, um, the only way that I know to prepare is to just review as much of part one as possible because we don't know what's going to be in part two. <laughs> so, Yeah, something to look forward to. Also, I am not sure if the notebooks are out there yet, so uh, they might be in a hidden repository, but they're not on the course V3 repository yet. Okay, so if there are no more questions, uh, we can conclude our meeting, and we're actually only two minutes over, so, <laughs> so that's great. Thank, uh, I, Thanks, Marcelo. That was a really interesting problem, and I, if I have some time this week, I want to look at it too. Um, and, and it's just a really interesting problem. Thank you very much. All right. Is there anything else that anyone wants to? Uh, so, so next week we'll cover um, we'll cover lesson six, uh, and I'll try to um, sort of do the parts of lesson five that I skipped that I had to skip this time. Um, and, and then we can have a presentation, uh, a mini presentation on a paper would be nice. Um, um, so be thinking about that if you want to do that. Or maybe I could, I could share my implementation of this paper. So I've been trying to bring it to IMDB dataset. Oh, this is the paper that you went over today? Yeah. Oh, okay, great, okay. Sure. All right, everyone, we'll have a great day and uh, we'll see you again next week. Bye bye. Thank you. Next week. Thank you. Uh, just one last question. Um, with okay. regards to imp- implementing models within papers, is there is there a resource where uh, you provide or anybody else has provided where you can learn how to implement the models you come across in papers? Because I find it initially a little bit difficult to read a paper and how they've described an algorithm and then implement that in Python. Is, is there somewhere? There is, there is a resource and I, it's called Papers with Code. Papers I'll, put the link, code yes. yeah, I'll put the link up and um, I haven't looked at it, but I just sort of marked it, bookmark it because it does exactly what you're saying. People, uh, people um, show how to implement uh, important papers in, in code and they put up their GitHub repositories and so on. Um, so it's just exactly what you're looking for. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah. I really appreciate the link. Somebody put that up already, so that's great. 
Thanks. Um, uh, is it going to come up in the chat box or somewhere it, else? It's in the chat, and we'll put the chat on on uh, on this. We'll put the chat on the channel uh, afterwards on the deep learning. What's it called? DL. Uh, Sonia, what's the what's the uh, channel called? DL underscore. Fast AI DL. We'll put we'll put it on that. Okay. Uh, on that Thank channel. you. Thanks. Okay. Um, thanks, everyone.